we who are privileged to live in this particular area live in one of the most beautiful parts of the world, I think. It's truly, truly spectacular. And it's just a wonderful place to live and to visit. We get here about 4.6 million visitors a year. They kind of attest to the draw of the Monterey Peninsula and its area. And our visitors come to see the gorgeous scenery or to explore the magnificent coastline that we have here. And some of them explore the water beneath the sea where it's absolutely spectacular. So what is it that makes this area so different? What makes it unique? Well, we certainly have an ocean and that is a major part of it, but the entire west coast of California is bordered by an ocean and there's only one Monterey Peninsula. So that's not quite it. The forests, we have beautiful forests, but they're forests all up and down the coast. And again, that, that's a part of the draw, but it's not this, the main story. The climate, well, if you, uh, if you like fog, it's, it's pretty good, but um, I think if you really want a climate, you would probably migrate a bit further south. But the one thing that is unique to this area are the rocks and the remarkable history that they tell us. So that's what our presentation is about today. Rocks here span about 80 million years, which seems like an awfully long time. But when you put it in the context of the history of the Earth, the origin of the Earth being about 4.6 billion years, we're sort of at the very end. We overlap just a bit with the age of the dinosaurs. Monterey geologic history kind of resembles a fine Swiss cheese in that it's full of holes or, or gaps. And uh, while we have about 80 million years of the rocks underlying this area, those rocks actually are covering relatively small parts of that time. Most of the time is mystery. We don't know for sure what happened. In some cases, we we can infer some things that had to have happened within there, but we don't know the details. We have no record of it. And this is a good place to talk about the difference between time and, and history. And that is time flows continuously. It's always there, it's always going, but history is more like a series of snapshots of the past or from the past. And typically they get further and further apart the farther you go back in time. And my grandson, who's now in college, would probably slip my throat if he knew I was using his baby pictures for this presentation. But it does illustrate how history compares with time and the fact that the historian or the geologist has these snapshots and there our job is to figure out what those snapshots mean and then try to interpolate between the snapshots to figure what went on between them. And so our first snapshot is from 80 million years ago. And this is a rock called granodiorite that formed at that time. And it's the foundation rock. This is a rock that underlies this entire area. You stripped away all of the other sediments, material that sat on top, scraped it all off. What you'd end up with is this rock that's formerly known as this mouthful, the porphyritic granodiorite of Monterey. And in the older literature, it was called the Santa Lucia granodiorite. And this is a sturdy rock. It resists the waves. And 
Therefore, it contributes to the rugged coastline that we have here that's such a neat defining feature of the area. It's a rock of fiery origin. It's a rock that formed miles below the surface of the earth, several miles below the surface of the earth, crystallizing from a molten mass. And it's been reliably dated radiometrically as in the range of 75 to 85 million years with most of the dates sort of clustering around 80 million years. And at the time this rock crystallized, there were still dinosaurs walking around up on the surface of the earth. It's part of something that was called the Selenia problem. And the Selenia problem was something of baffled geologists for years. It was Selenia is a giant block of granitic crust or continental crust that's situated between rocks that formed in the ocean. And how did this thing get there? It puzzled geologists for a long time. One of them called it the sore thumb of California geology. And it wasn't until we had the development of plate tectonic theory that we really began to understand what selenia was. And plate tectonic theory just specifies that there are some giant plates, about seven of them, and a whole series of small plates of the Earth's crust, and they move, uh, jostle against one another, and this creates much of the geology that we see. North America, we have two different kinds of margins between or boundaries between the continental plates, the North American plate and the South American plate, and the oceanic plates, the giant Pacific plate, Juan de Fuca to the north, Cocos, Nazca, and Antarctic. And in some places like California, the two plates, the Pacific plate is sliding by the North American plate a sliding margin or a transform margin. But for most of the rest of the margin of North and South America, the two plates are colliding and producing what geologists call a subducting margin. What this is uh, in simple terms is that the new crust wells up on oceanic ridges erupts in the form of undersea volcanoes, and that material is continuously resupplied, which pushes the older material off to the side, and it moves until it encounters another plate. And if that plate is a continental plate, composed of lighter rocks and elements, it slides beneath it in what geologists call subduction. And water, immense amount of water gets carried down into the subduction zone. And eventually it gets carried down to the point that uh, it can no longer, the pressure is just too much and it escapes into the overlying rocks. And if those rocks are very hot, the water reduces the attraction of the molecules and atoms, and uh, the rock melts and forms a liquid magma, which can vent at the surface in the form of volcanoes. And so we have, for example, the, the Juan de Fuca plate up to the north is a subducting plate, and uh, the evidence for the uh, processes that are going on deep within the earth are the Cascade Range volcanoes, uh, beautiful mountains, but also potentially quite dangerous. So we go back in time now to the 80 million years, the time when our granodiorite formed. And what we had in North America was bordered in the Southern part by a giant plate called the Farallon Plate. 
and the Farallon plate was colliding with the North American plate and producing subduction. As that subduction progressed and the rock cooled, it formed an igneous rock down deep beneath the surface of the earth. And in our case, it was the granodiorite at about 80 million years. Now, that happened, we're not quite sure where. I'm showing it here as Northern Mexico, others show it in southernmost California. But in any, either case, it's a long way from the future Monterey Peninsula. And so if it formed miles below the surface of the earth in Northwestern Mexico, how did it get here? And actually, this is a two-part question. First part is getting, how do you get to the surface? Because that's where it is today. And secondly, how did it get from wherever it formed to the south, probably hundreds of miles, how did it get to Monterey? And here we're going to just look at the first part, the first question, how did it get to the surface? And this is a real puzzle. We know it was at the surface about 50 to 55 million years ago because it was incised by a submarine canyon and which meant it was exposed on the continental margin. So it goes from being miles below the surface of the earth and then is pushed up to the edge of the continent to the continental slope. And this raises all kinds of questions. How did this happen? When did it happen? Why did it happen? And it occurred sometime, we know, between 80 million years and 50 to 55 million years when the sedimentary rocks that are sitting on top of it accumulated. But uh, we don't know really when in that period it happened or why. But there was one event that I noted as I put this together. And that event occurred 66 million years ago, and it was a big one. A rock the size of Mount Everest collided with what today is the Yucatan Peninsula and ended the Mesozoic era and the reign of the dinosaurs, changed the world forever. And Yucatan seems like a long way off, but at that time, our rocks were much further to the south. They were a lot closer. And I really sort of doubt whether that was a factor in causing this granite to shift its position, but something happened and it's a possibility that it was a legacy of the KT impact. In whatever case, it did happen, and it was incised by a submarine canyon and material accumulated in that canyon. Submarine canyons are really sort of major mystifying features on the surface of the continent. Uh, we happen to have one of the world's best studied right in our own backyard, Monterey Submarine Canyon, which has been a lot of really good recent research by the people at Ambari. And then there's Carmel Submarine Canyon, a tributary canyon, comes right up almost to Point Lobos. And these canyons have absolutely nothing to do with the canyon that formed at Point Lobos. It's just pure coincidence that this canyon that formed 50 to 55 million years ago is now sitting adjacent to some of the world's biggest canyons or one of the world's biggest canyons um, today. How do we know it was deep water? Well, there are some fossils, uh, tiny little foraminifera that have been found at Point Lobos. There's age gives us, gives us our age of 50 to 55 million years and a water depth that's around 200 to 600 meters. And this is consistent. Both of these are consistent with everything else that we find in 
the rock. But there is an awful lot of sand and gravel that was deposited in that submarine canyon. And how in the world did that get there? When I was an undergraduate, all of this material would have been attributed to shallow water deposition, um, despite the fact that it doesn't look like anything anybody's ever found deposited by shallow water conditions. But um, at the time, there was just no known mechanism for carrying sand and let alone gravel into the deep ocean. But in Europe, there were geologists who were doing experimental studies in a tank of water. They mixed up a slurry of sand, mud, and water and put it on a ramp. And as they thought it would, it formed a separate current flowing below the surface right down the ramp. And they call this a turbidity current. Probably the onshore process that most resembles this would be a snow avalanche with snow and ice, other material coming down a mountain slope. But it's now thought that these turbidity currents are a really important means of transporting sand into the deep ocean. And as a turbidity current loses energy, the largest particles it's carrying will drop out first and then smaller and smaller particles will accumulate on top of that. So what you get is a graded bed that's coarse on the bottom and fine on the top. Here's a set of these. You can see them. The sandstones, which are the light colored layers, have sharp bases, well-defined bases. But if you look at the top where they turn into the mudstone, which is the gray, you see it's a gradational and um, indistinct top with sharp bases characteristic of deposits of turbidity currents. This is from Point Lobos. And you can see the sand bed that's underneath the pencil and the one that's immediately above that it has a very sharp bottom contact with the sand and then a fuzzier contact as the sand goes up into the grayer, muddy layers at the top. And it's not just these two beds. In this photograph, basically every sandstone bed you see shows the same pattern. Every one of these was deposited by a turbidity current, some big, some small. And some of the thicker, coarser beds show the same thing. Um, coarser sand at the bottom, fine sand at the top. So turbidity currents were a big factor in producing the sand beds at Point Lobos. But the conglomerate poses another problem. Now, not all the conglomerate is problematic because where you get sort of a mangled up mass, just a mess of gravel and sand like this, you can attribute it to an undersea landslide debris flow uh, that moved down the slope, slide, slid down the slope, probably accompanied by turbidity current, maybe generating the turbidity current and carrying its deposit down into deep water. But most of the conglomerates in Point Lobos are too well organized to be debris flows. And this proved to be a, a major issue in trying to come up with the interpretation of these deposits. And they have some strange features. One of the things is that in the conglomerates, unlike the sandstone, the grading, the size change is just the reverse. They're fine at the bottom and they get coarse at the top. And this is characteristic of, of most of the bedded gravels in the, um, in the Carmelo formation at Point Lobos. And then there are these strange things, floating boulders, the biggest class tend to be floating out in the sand. How in the world does that happen? Well, I think I know the answer. I think what we had were turbidity currents that were driving 
masses of gravel at their bottom. And these, these gravel bed, the pebbles were jostling, banging against him, one another. And when you get that kind of jostling, the horse's pebbles go up and the finer pebbles go down. And so this gives you the inverse grading. And then the flow loses a bit of steam, the gravel stops moving, but the sand keeps on flowing and the turbidity current goes on down the slope and it rolls pebbles off the top of the bed. And these are the largest of the pebbles in the conglomerate. So that accounts for these very large pebbles, small boulders in some cases out in the sand. So we have at Point Lobos, a fossil submarine canyon, probably I think maybe the best in the world, geologists come here from all over the world to look at it. And it's a, a sort of a separate treasure unto itself. The canyon floor was not devoid of life as are canyon floors today. And in the Carmelo Formation, in the muddier and sandier beds, you get all sorts of strange patterns in the rocks. And these patterns are the tracks, trails, burrows, residences of organisms that lived on the seafloor. We're looking down on a bedding plane surface here. So we're looking down on the top of a bed and you can see all kinds of strange patterns strange features on that, all produced by organisms that lived there at the time when the canyon was active. Some of these we can tell a little bit about, these, these funny tubular-like things with the bumps along the sides. Those bumps are mud pellets, and we find them where the tubes go through the sand. When they go through the sand, the mud pellets were packed along the outside to keep the burrows from collapsing. And we can say that because there are ghost shrimp today on the East Coast that do the same thing. They pack mud pellets around the outside of their burrows to keep them from collapsing. And so there was some organism, maybe a ghost shrimp-like animal, I don't know, but lived there and it was using that same pattern. Probably, without any question, I'd say the, the most striking trace fossil at Point Lobos is called Helicnus lobosensus, scientific name. It was given to it, lobosensus being from Point Lobos. Helicnus is derived from Gary Hill, who was a young geologist who worked with me, who was interested in biology and he helped me with the trace fossils and did the, sort of the first really putting together the three-dimensional trace that this, this organism produced. But we don't know what it was. Uh, it was originally thought to be fossil kelp and the first papers on it described it as such. And it really does look like feather boa kelp, but it moves up and down within the sediment, which fossil kelp wouldn't do and disturbs the sediment, which fossil kelp wouldn't do. And it also, the dark material is mud, not organic matter. So it's an amazing trace. And I don't think we still know what it is. It's been attributed to a clam, but I don't, I find all sorts of problems with that. So if you go to Point Lobos and you go to Western Beach, you've got a weird, wonderful fauna beneath your feet. And you might want to watch where you step because there's some strange things in those rocks. Following the submarine canyon, we have another long gap in time, 23 million years. That's a long time. And our next information comes from volcanic rocks that we see on the north side and to a degree on the south side of Carmel Beach. And that's Pebble Beach Golf Course in the distance. It's a lens cap for scale, but this is a volcanic rock formed from a volcano. And it was well dated at 
27 million years ago. You can see it again, it crops out at Arrowhead Point and out there the only people who can really see it up close and personal are the golfers who seriously misplay the seventh green. This is a rock that formed probably at a very important time. 50 million years ago, we still had the Farallon plate colliding with the North American plate. But to the south of this was a Pacific plate. And the Pacific plate and the other plates were all moving to the north, which meant with time, the Pacific plate is going to collide with the North American plate. This shows it approaching the Pacific plate, approaching North American plate about 35 million years ago, but it hasn't encountered it yet. And the next slide shows, I guess at 25 million years ago. And at that point, it probably had encountered it and was starting to move to North. Split the Farallon plate into two plates, the Juan de Fuca plate to the North and the Cocos plate to the South both of which still exist, but are much smaller than the original uh, Farallon plate from which they were derived. And so it was sometime in that period that the volcanic rock erupted and quite possibly marks the time of the Pacific plate collision. So a very important point in West Coast geology. This is just looking at that, that same thing, the collision and Pacific plate moving to the north. So if our granite diorite formed miles below the surface in northwestern Mexico, how did it get here? And this is part of a plate tectonic story. So now we talk about getting to Monterey. And this is a series of um, poor man's uh, um, cartoons. Originally, they were drawn animation by Tanya Atwater at UC Santa Barbara. Tanya was one of the people who was the first to really use plate tectonics to explain the West Coast geology. And she is, I, I consider her a, a total guru on West Coast mega geology. And so I reproduced some of her illustrations here to show what I think happened. But we have the Pacific plate now is offshore, the Farallon plate. And what you're going to see here, a, a dot and an X, and the, these don't move. One, the X shows the location of these early rocks, the granodiorite and the Carmelo Formation and the andesite, the volcanic rock. And the white dot shows the present location of the Monterey Peninsula. And they don't move in, the, in what you're going to see. What does move is a black arrow, which shows the location of those rocks through time. And time is represented by the scale on the right-hand side of the figure. So I'm gonna take you through a, a poor man's animation that shows what happened in forming the geology here. Farallon plate is being consumed, Pacific plate is approaching, it arrives and it starts moving. Now we have the Pacific plate there, but our rocks are still located in that same position. They haven't started to move yet. And this continues till we get up to about, oh, 20 million years, 18 million years, and 18 million years. Now they're starting to move north. And they move north. Coast builds out. San Andreas Fault is just now coming into play at about six and a half million years. And there we are. Would you like to see it again? Most people want to see it again. So let me backtrack it. 
And we'll run through it a little bit faster this time. Here comes the Pacific plate, collision, new boundary. Then our rocks start to move north. Come up coast and eventually end up where they are today. So that is where we stand at 27 million years ago. They had not started to move. Now our next rock that we have is a boulder conglomerate. And we don't know a whole lot about this because there are no fossils in it, but it starts in Stillwater Cove. In fact, it crops out of about a quarter of Stillwater Cove, and that's the only place that we see it. Um, it's a very small part of the rock of the Monterey Peninsula, but I think it could be a really important one. Its age is uncertain. We know it is younger than the volcanic rocks because it contains pieces of them within it. So we know it's younger than that, but mostly what it's made up of is giant, rounded, granitic boulders. And so we don't know what the age is. It could be anywhere in that, that span uh, from say, 16, 17, 18 million years ago down to 25 million years ago. Somewhere in there, there was a fanglomerate. Fanglomerates, this is a, an example, and they're, they're unique, I think. I don't know of any other kind of deposit that looks like these. And they form on alluvial fans that come out of a mountainous area. I think if you look on that slope, you can see some some boulders just sitting on that slope. But that is an example of an alluvial fan, which requires a mountainous area as a source. And we can look at the orientation of the pebbles and see they're sort of stacked in against one another and tell from that that they were moving to the south, which meant there was a granitic source, a highland source, possibly mountainous to the north, which seems really in Congress, doesn't it? Uh, today where we have Monterey Bay, back sometime in the past, we had mountains. And those mountains might've been important. You can get mountains along a plate boundary where it makes a bend and the two plates essentially what you get is compression. And that compression pushes the rocks up and forms the mountain areas. And so the Monterey Peninsula might've been right on the edge of one of these mountain areas. And if we look back at our cartoon here, as we go back, when the rocks first start to move, if there was one of those faults or a bend in that fault to produce the mountains, that would explain why we had the mountains to the north of us here. So this might be indicating the onset of northward transport of these rocks. Possibly the time when selenia started to move north. Then we have another gap and it's broken by an incursion of the sea. Coastal areas, the geology really depends on a balance between sea level change and crustal movements, whether the crust is moving up or down in one hand or whether sea level is moving up and down uh, by itself on the other. And in this particular case, crustal movement is the more important, 15 to 16 million years ago. So if you start off with the kind of rocks we've been talking about and the shoreline starts sinking, the land is subsiding, sea rises over the top of that and pushes shoreward. 
and as it comes in, it can leave deposits. And I think had that incursion of the sea not happened, that happened 15, 16 million years ago, if that had not happened, one of the most iconic treasures of the Central Coast would not exist. And by that, I mean Point Lobos. Now, how do we get there? Well, story starts on Carmel Beach, where after a winter storm, you have really well exposed rocks. And in those rocks, I found, and looking at them, basically all the evidence I would want to find that indicated they formed by an encroaching sea, a barrier island system. There's evidence of reversing flow, which means tidal flow. In the muddy deposits are, are rhizomes of marsh plants that formed in the, the wetlands. Trace fossils are all spectacular and indicative of very shallow water deposits. One trace that's only found, as far as I know, on beaches and in estuaries is very prevalent in these rocks. And then there's some coarse deposits that look like they were flood deposits that came in from the landward side. Basically all the things you'd want to see in a encroaching sea deposit of barrier island kind of system. This rock crops out around sort of a band in the Monterey Peninsula, but to the south, there are coal bearing beds that one of the professors at Stanford told me that when he did his thesis, he got the age of the coal from some of the polynomorphs, you know, little spores, and it indicated it was the same age as the rocks that accumulated in the, the shoreline deposits, the unnamed sandstone. And that would be consistent because the shorelines have marsh and wetlands associated with them where coal beds would likely form. So we switched to Point Lobos in the 1890s, and they were owned by a gentleman named J.O. Emery. And Joseph Emery was a partner who bought all of Point Lobos in 1850, essentially to use as a granite quarry, which still you can see the remnants of at Whaler's Cove. He was an absentee landlord. He lived in, in Oakland and made a name for himself by supervising the dredging of Oakland Harbor, which really put Oakland on the map. And in the 1890s, he subdivided Point Lobos up into a whole series of little lots, called it Carmelito Village, and trying to sell these off. And fortunately for us, this was a time of one of the great depressions. So there wasn't a lot of loose cash flying around. And secondly, there was no bridge over the Carmel River. So it was kind of isolated down here. Now, in addition to Point Lobos, Emory also owned a coal mine up Mount Paso Creek, about three miles from Point Lobos. And he was mining coal and hauling it by wagon to Point Lobos, where it was shipped out of Weathers Cove and what has been called Coal Shoot Point. And the mine was really a pretty dreadful mine. It was always flooding. It was, it was a very, very difficult. It went down about 165 feet. So it was, it was a substantial depth. And to help him try to stabilize this mine, he brought in an engineer. The engineer was not specifically a mining engineer. His name is Alexander Allen. And he was best known as a builder of racetracks, including the Santa Anita racetrack in Southern California. And he built one in Emeryville, which is probably where Emery encountered him. And Emery knew that he had grown up in the coal bearing areas of Pennsylvania and had worked in the mines as a young man. So he thought he could help him with the coal. Well, I don't think he helped him much, but what happened was that Alexander Allen and his wife fell in love with Point Lobos. And they bought up all those little lots. 
And when he passed on in the 1930s, his heirs sold it to the state to be used as a state reserve. And it's because of Alexander Allen and the coal and that incursion of the sea that as you drive down Highway 1, you do not see this sign. So sea level continued to rise and water got deeper. And eventually what we had was a marginal sea, a basin that probably formed somewhere in Southern California, maybe near the, the border with Mexico. It was one of a number of basins that occurred along that area. All of these basins were remarkable in that they had lots and lots of diatoms, little microscopic plants or protists. And uh, these are beautiful little things. And the weird thing about them is that their shells are made of silica, the same material as window glass, actually a form of opal rather than window glass, but pretty much the same thing. And these tests accumulate on the floor of the these bays or seas and uh, formed material that was called diatomaceous mud or, or ooze. And under heat and pressure, this got turned to rock. And we see that rock all around the Monterey Peninsula as a in road cuts as a light colored rock, very finely layered and, and quite crumbly. This is a Monterey formation. But it's not everywhere crumbly. There are places where the mineralogy is such that the rock is much sturdier, it breaks along surfaces, flat surfaces, but it's a, a much sturdier rock and it's used as a building stone, called Carmel stone, throughout the Monterey Peninsula, including some of our more iconic buildings like the Carmel Mission or the initial Tour house built by Robertson Jeffers. And so, following the development of that sea, now we're getting into recent periods and the landscaping of the mountains and the valleys. Uh, land rose up again, the marginal seas disappeared, and uh, our area became one of mountains that were pretty much controlled, I think by the plate tectonic movements. So the Pacific plate moving to the north anywhere from two to four inches a year and the north rubbing against the North America plate producing the San Andreas Fault. If you take a tablecloth and you put two hands on it, move one toward you and one away from you, you get wrinkles. And that's Kind of what we get here with the rubbing of these two giant plates, big wrinkles like the Santa Cruz Mountains, Diablo Range, Gabalon, and valleys like the Santa Clara, the San Benito, and the Salinas Valley moving down. And so we have in most recent million years the rising of the Monterey Peninsula because this is one of the areas of uplift. The rate of uplift increases as we go to the south. And you superimpose upon that Pleistocene glaciation and you get one of the most obvious features along the coast that we see today. So sea level change now becomes the, the dominant control on what the shoreline is doing. And that sea level is moving up and down in accordance with the ice ages, because we're now in the Pleistocene ice ages, where huge amounts of water are withdrawn from the sea and incorporated ice on the continents that then melts and drains back into the sea and sea level goes back up. So sea level has this fluctuation up and down depending upon the glacial episodes. 
we look at the last 400,000 years, you can see we've got a, this pattern pretty well defined, pretty, pretty well established. And superimposed upon it is an uplift of the land here in the Monterey area. This is Whaler's Cove at Point Lobos. We're looking at the backside of it. And there is a flat surface, which was, a, I think, a fossil seafloor that formed about 100,000 years ago. And it's standing about 15 feet above present shoreline. And it probably formed at a water depth of about 30 feet. So that means that in the period of time at 100,000 years, the land surface has risen about 45 feet. So what happens is you get the erosional cutting of a wave platform, a wave cut platform, flat surface. And then at, that's at a high stand. Then as sea level falls, it leaves that up high and dry. In the meantime, it's moving upwards, rising. So that when sea level comes back as in three, that old surface is up above sea level and it cuts a new one. And it proceeds to do this with number four, another fall in sea level, and again, coming back up the land surface has risen. <clears throat> so you get these flat surfaces that are elevated marine terraces. And you can see these very, very readily, all particularly as you move to the south, uh, they're higher the further south you go. So there's a differential uplift uh, toward the south. But this is looking across Moss Cove at Point Lobos. And there's the flat surface that is the lowest terrace. And the middle terrace, you can see, is where the road is, the flat surface over there. Then there's the highest one which is uh, the flat surface with homes built on it. And you can actually see a shoreline scar, I think, that goes across that hillside in the distance. It's the scar that's associated with that highest terrace. And here you can see it again, looking across Pebble Beach, the golf course from Carmel. And you can see the low marine terrace and then a somewhat older, higher terrace above that. And I really think that if it weren't for these marine terraces, the Pebble Beach Golf Course, another treasure of the peninsula, would not exist because it wouldn't have the flat land and put a golf course. A map of the Monterey Peninsula, a geologic map looking down on the surface, looks something like this with bands, alternating bands of, of um, Pleistocene, terrace material, and Cretaceous granite diorite. And you don't get that impression from looking at this, but what these are a series of stair steps with the one closest to the sea furthest down being the youngest and the oldest one being up at the top. And these stair steps are present, they get higher as you go to the south. Now the Monterey Peninsula does have its faults, a number of them actually. And many of these, most of them, if you look at them, are up on their south side. All the ones dashed lines are up on the south side. This is in response to this differential uplift where the area to the south is rising faster than the area to the north. Uh, any one of these faults can generate an earthquake. I have felt one earthquake from, I think, the Cypress Point fault. Uh, but the earthquakes are small. They're, they're, they're in the range of uh, most of them would be barely detectable. But that's not necessarily true of another fault, the Navy fault, the Tulacitos fault, which the Tulacitos is really a lengthy fault. It goes up the the Carmel Valley, and if a significant part of it ruptured, it could generate a, a, a significant earthquake here. But I think the, the biggest threat of earthquakes really lies offshore. The San Gregorio Fault is part of the San Andreas Fault system. 
And this halt in 1926, on October 22nd, had two earthquakes an hour apart, each 6.1. And it didn't do that much damage in Monterey. Santa Cruz got really pretty heavily hit, but it was probably because it was more developed than Monterey at the time. But should those same earthquakes happen today, they would, uh, they would do a lot of damage. So that's the fault that I think I'd be most concerned about in this area. So anyway, you take these magnificent rocks, you cover them up with forests, Monterey pine, groves of Monterey cypress, you add some Pacific coast fog, and you've got the peninsula. What a great place. And that ends the presentation, but the story will continue. The Great Plates will continue to move, the ocean will continue to erode, and the Monterey Peninsula will disappear in time. And we're just so very lucky to come along at a time when we can experience it and also unravel the story that led to its creation.